Thad Beckham here. Hope you're having a good day. Me and Keith Shannon got together the other day and shot two videos actually. Um, well, we killed two birds with one stone. And the first video concerns what would have been most important to the southeastern people, you know, 500 to 1,000 years ago. Uh, concerning their use of white woods for bows and their bow designs. Uh, the second half, part two, is on tillerin. A lot of people's asked about our tillerin techniques, and this video is full of information. So, part one, part two. First one, the thousand year old bow, and the second one is tillering the thousand year old bow. Now, we're not using stone tools to do this. We're just trying to show you what you can achieve. I do have some stone bow making videos coming, but this is just for the knowledge and information. So thank you. I hope you like, subscribe, and share my channel, and hope you enjoy these videos. Thank you. I shot a video a while back called Force Drying Your Bow Wood and the bow wood that I used in that video was persimmon. Well, I took it out the other day after me and Keith Shannon had fire hardened it and was gonna start working on it a bit. I got distracted. I left the bow outside at the shed. Uh, three inches of blowing rain come in, totally soaked my bow. I realized it, I run to rescue my bow and I got inside, checked it and it had risen to 10 percent back belly sides everything which is still pretty amazing 10 percent but anyway i um i put it up the next day i took the moisture meter and pegged it and it was six percent front back side everything so it was back to six percent in 24 hours if that's not important to a bow maker i don't know what is so it's just another example to reinforce um, what's really important with this uh, file hardening process. And, uh, you know, it's, it just kind of woke me up again. It's like, wow, wow, you know, that's crazy. But that's what happened. Keith, we got an experiment going on here, and this is not the normal way that we file harden. Um, what are we attempting to do here with this method? Um, well, what, you know, what we talked about, Thad, is we're going to try to make a bow that the way you and I think was probably very closely done a thousand years ago. And we're going to try to achieve the goals that they would have been after a thousand years ago. And we're thinking primarily to southeastern Indians in a high humidity situation working with white woods. And, you know, as we've discussed, uh, and any of y'all that's listened to more than one or two of our YouTubes, uh, the, the humidity is the worst thing that can, you can uh, put on white wood. And in order to overcome it, fire hardening does the best job of anything we know of as far as making the word the wood hydrophobic right but what we normally do with our normal fire hardening, and what we've taught a lot of people to do is, is brown it about halfway through right and that way you're not overdoing you're not underdoing and it's a good medium for our modern designs with modern finishes right yeah but a thousand years ago it was different and those fellows just didn't do it for a hobby a couple times a week. They would take these white woods and go on excursions for them from a week to three months. Right. Depending on what they were doing. And these bows were out in the elements those, that length, those times. So the most important thing back then would, have, would be to have a, if, you, if you're making your bow out of white wood, is to make a bow that could handle the moisture and the humidity. Right. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked about it, and in my opinion, and I think you agree, uh, the designs that were used back then, the southeastern D-bows, 
that's not a real high stress design and they could very easily handle a wood that's browned all the way through. Oh, and, and in actuality, we've done it a number of times, right. accidentally browned them all the way through. Right. Even high stress designs and they held up well. So it's not that it can't be done. It's just that it's in our, with our modern lifestyle and modern fishing, it's not absolutely necessary. Well, Keith, it was documented pretty much that they did fire She's in her bows over fire. That ain't even debatable. I found it from references with the Beothal Cagonquins up in Newfoundland all the way down to Florida. That that same process, exactly how they done that, we really don't know, but we're doing it like we think it probably was done. Well, you know, the Spanish documented in the late 15, early 1600 period and 150 years, the English came in and documented the same, same thing. Same thing. So they, it wasn't, it's, it's, we know they did it. Right. But it only makes sense, but you know, without fire hardening, hickory is the worst wood you could possibly have in the Southeast. Right. It's got the most moisture problem. So I really don't think they spent 3,000 years experimenting with making bow, bows and ended up with the worst wood right. in its raw state. Right. But of course, as we know, when you fire harden it, <coughs> it turns to one of the best woods. And we and do know the, the basic, as far as what's been recorded, which isn't everything, but we know the bows were pretty much long and narrow like an English long bow, but rectangular basically rectangular. Some of them varied slightly, but they were long and narrow longbows, right. and they spread out the stress. We're not trying to overstress these bows. We just, these are just pretty much straight staves. Uh, this one's got a little setback in it, the uh, persimmon, but the others are basically straight, and we just put them over the fire. And we're just seeing no forms. We're yeah. just putting them on like they are. We'll we'll straighten them as they're in, during the cooling process. Right. But the goal here is to make a bow the way we think it was likely done. A, a southeastern D bow style. A thousand years browned ago. Browned all the way yeah. through. Mississippian period. Right. Yeah. Browned all the way through so that it is as hydrophobic as it can possibly be. Yeah. And um but and we're a, doing it over a different kind of pit altogether. We're doing it like they probably would have done it. And, and uh, for the guys that don't know, you know, a handle bow, all the stress is mid limb, both limbs. But with a, a long D bow, the whole bow's working. So the stress, the stress is spread out over that full length. A lot of bowyers know that, but for you guys that don't, and it's a very good way to make a bow that follows the string less. Instead of making it wide, you make it, it long. Good performance. Yeah. It won't be your top performer, but it'll be very good. And um, but I don't think they were looking for bow competition. Not at, not at all. They wanted a functional bow that would do the job and hold up against. And if they had to go spend three months getting to somewhere, they needed a bow that was in good form. Right. It would would do the job they needed done. Right, and, and they did that regular. I can, oh, yeah. I can say that from my investigations that they were constantly on the move with hunting and wars and, and hundreds bows, of miles, hundreds of miles. These bows right out in the elements, day and night. Right. Yeah, I mean, you don't even have a permanent place no, you're camping. to stay. You're, you're, camping, you're in, camping with a lean-to or something, a temporary shelter, which isn't ideal. You know, it's not, you know, your air-conditioned home, but those fellows traveled hundreds of miles with their weapons and kept them in good condition. You know, and you know that's really not a practical thought with raw white wood. No. That's, that's, that's not a practical concept. And, and, and considering what fire hardening does, and the Spanish and English said they put them over the fires, and you know what happens when that when you do that that's what they were doing and that's what we're duplicating and we're going to try to make a couple of southeastern type bows we're going to brown them all the way through so that we have the maximum amount of hydrophobicness right and uh 
do it old school. Right. And we just threw a little makeshift rack up here, and the bows are just laying up a little higher than we normally do. We just letting time take its effect. But anybody that thinks that a bow that's browned all the way through can't make a good bow, even under high stress design, I've got news for you. Yeah. They'll do. It's not necessary. I don't really teach that, but I've done it many times. And I want to say this too. Keith, uh, I've had people see what we've done in the past. Oh, well, you got this form. The Indians didn't have forms. How did they put back set in their bow? Well, I don't think most of their bows were back set, but believe me, they had techniques and ways to manipulate the wood like they wanted to. Well, Thad, you know, uh, if they can make pyramids, I'm certain they can make a bow form if they want it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, know? a guy asked me, and, it, you know, he's, he doesn't know. I'm not criticizing him. But he's saying, how did they do that? They didn't have these two-by-four forms. <laughs> well, it doesn't take that. I could take one of these bows and tie a heavy rock to it, dead center, and flex it back when it's green, and put a back set into it or just stack weight on top of it. I mean, you could drive a stake in with a, with a peg overhang and drive the bow down it and keep it bent. And that means there's a million different ways you could do this. I'm not saying anybody ever did anything like that. Well, if they wanted to, they could cut down a tree, they could make a two by four and they could make a front a, a, a <laughs> form out of it. You know, they, yeah. these guys were a lot smarter than what most people give them credit for. Yeah, we're not talking about cavemen. We're talking about homo sapien people who have the same, I would argue, more intelligence than the average guy today because uh, it's just the way I see things. But <laughs> your cell phone doesn't make you smart, you know. But um, anyhow, that's our goal here. And, um, uh, and if, if, you know, if I, if I hadn't, brown them all the way through, I wouldn't know what to think. Right. But the fact that we have done it, we know what the outcome is going to be, but we just want to show everybody that, yeah. uh, and especially with a low stress design, if any of y'all want to make D bows or long bows or bend through the handle, there's no problem to brown them all the way through, hickory in particular. Uh, and uh, yep. I'd, I'd argue you can probably do it with just about any wood with a low stress design. But hickory's a definite definite because it's so darn indestructible but you can give up some of that strength on the back I mean I told Keith I believe we could rotate things these staves over and cook the back a little I'm sure we could I mean that that was what I was thinking we was gonna do today it was just kind of rotate them a bit like cooking a hamburger or something but uh, Keith said no let's just cook them from the belly well, the all the way through. Well, the fact some of these got uh, natural, yeah. a little bit of reflex, and it'd be yeah. a little bit harder to keep it up. But browning, browning all the way through from the belly side, you can't go wrong with that. And uh, You see, we got our fuel over here, just most of it oak, some hickory and stuff. And we just shoveling the fuel up under this little makeshift rack. It's nothing complicated. Something we'll, somebody could have did in the past so easily. And we'll keep the heat. Uh, it's a nice good heat to it where it stays good and hot. And uh, when these coals burn down, we'll just replace them with more coals. When it's brown, it's done. Yeah. And it's just about that simple. That's and then we're, gonna, then we're gonna do a tillering video here shortly. That's right. This is gonna be a two-part thing here. And we're gonna show for all, uh, all you people that have seen me using a yardstick when we're tilling a bow, we're going to show you how to tiller with a yardstick and probably get one of the best tillers you've ever had. Now all we got to do is wait on time. Yep, yeah, we'll do what it takes to get it brown all the way through. And it, yeah, it's just it's just time now, just letting it letting it cook. And as when we take them off and they begin to cool, we'll, as it's cool, we'll straighten anything we need to straighten and let it cool that way.
Yeah, we add some uh, Kingsford charcoal to it to, um, we don't really care, wood or charcoal. Everybody goes through a learning curve in fire hardening. You know, I've never really done it this way before. And I'm pretty dialed into the way I do it, but this is a learning curve. And it appears that we, we initially had it a little bit too high to get the amount of heat that we needed. So what we found ourselves doing is lowering it down a good bit more, having put more fuel to it. And we've had a pretty windy day here. So we put up a little wind, wind blocker. And, uh, but now things are starting to go. Get there. You know, Thad, normally in our uh, fire hard, in the way we normally do it, we would be taking these off about right now. So this one here is browned about halfway through. But I'm going to take this brown in and bring it all the way in as we talked earlier. And we're going to brown it all the way through. Okay. And we're going to make this bow, for good or bad, yeah. just as hydrophobic as we can possibly make. Right, yeah. It's hot. <laughs> it is hot. Well, Thad, we got it. We got them done, and um, you know it took took quite a bit longer to get these browned all the way through, but we got it done. Now, you know this one right here is about the way we normally fire hardening with the browning going about halfway through, and you can kind of see the obvious lighter right. color on the outer back half. And this, it really is very good with modern finishes. Uh, but these obviously have been brown all the way through. Now, concerning the thousand year bow, this would have been pretty important because they didn't have modern finishes. They did have finishes and they were relatively good. But this bow, these two bows here are going to be more hydrophobic than this one. Now, my bows that I fire harden halfway through, for the most part, I keep them stored in a 50% humidity. You moisture test, uh, use your moisture meter. The belly will be about five and a half to six. The back will be at seven, almost without exception. Right. These right here are going to be less than seven. They're going to be in the five to six range even on the back. And of course, that's at 50% humidity. But you know, like we said earlier, you know, if you had to go out off for a month and you're in 90% humidity, uh, this these would be still be less than 10%. Right. Because I've left these outside for three months right on this table right here under this open shed and I've never had the moisture go over 11. So obviously this would be less than that. Yeah. So with just by any high humidity time period during the southeast, these would uh, be below 10. And, and the moisture is, you know, is, is really what? That's really what would have been important yeah. many years ago. Well, something and, else, um, Keith, a lot of people would think these, these bows have been cooked all the way through and we know hickory's got a super strong back so it can give up a little oh yeah but i think a lot of people will still be afraid to do this because i mean this bow's cooked oh yeah yeah but uh, and when we get into the tillering we're going to talk a little bit about this yes the back will probably be a little bit more brittle and you're going to need to be a little bit more on your game on the tillering but it's not that it can't be done. I've done, right. I've done it a number of times. It'll make a very fine bow. And, and again, we're going to make a low stress design. Right. Southeastern right. style. I've done this with high stress designs and it worked, worked very good. Low stress, he means like a historic Southeastern bow that is long and usually as long as the shooter and a D bow type that you know, bends, the whole bow's working, not just from the handle, you know, 
uh, out. That whole bow is sharing the stress. So this degree of browning all the way through would be very practical with that design. Type of design, yeah. And uh, kind of makes me think maybe that's why that design was as important as it yeah. was in the southeast, you know. Uh, but um, anyhow, that's what we got. We got it completed. We got it done. And, uh, and we did it on the ground with a little simple, yeah. you know. And you could have did it. You didn't have to do it all like we did in a one day period. No. I mean, just every day you could throw your bow up there a few hours. And, 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 and that's something everybody yeah. needs to realize is this, you don't have to fire hard and all at one time. Right. Uh, uh, you can do it in stages if you wish. If you don't get it enough. In fact, we didn't get it enough the first day. I had to come right. back and light it back up again to get it to where I right. want it. That's so, right. So, you know, it, it doesn't really matter as long as you get what you're after. And uh, But here they are, and we're ready to start. Uh, but get, now we got Tiller, one of these yeah. boats that's cooked all the way through. Yeah. Okay, I want to say one thing. For you guys that break raw hickory bows, there's no hope for you. Don't do this. <laughs> uh, we'll get into that. When you know, just joking. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to show them how to prevent, stop breaking bows. Right. We're right. going to give them yeah. a tool that will probably help them a lot right. to prevent breaking bows. And there's a really good reason a lot of people do that, and we'll share more of that later on. But um, anyhow, here we got it. Yeah. And, uh, and I, well, I, I think it's, you know, knowing what I know about fire hardening, know what we know that was written in the, in the, chronicles, in the, in the yeah. chronicles and diaries and journals of the early explorers. And, and uh, there's quite a lot on those subjects. Uh, and the fact that they did, they, they, they put their bows over the fires. And honestly, I think this is the, with this design, this is the way it was done. And, yeah. and when you think about the humidity these woods were in, this, this is where everything makes sense. Right. Everything right. makes sense right there. And, and you know, Keith, after after the video was done, the DVD, I was still researching and I found even as far north as Nova Scotia, yeah. the same description of bow making by the Algonquin people up there, Beathok Algonquin, that they were putting their bows over fire. From Florida to Nova Scotia, I mean, it was written, written by Europeans that they observed it. So it must have been something pretty significant. But like we you know, said earlier, when a culture of people have thousands of years to work with something, experiment with things, they're gonna come up with the most efficient designs for their environment. Right. This is, this is where it all makes sense right, right. here. That's right. I agree a hundred percent. And uh, you know, you're not going to spend that much time working at this and not end up perfecting it. I think this is where it's perfected in a high moisture environment, right there. You know, and if you look at the natives of the United States, come up with some really sophisticated bows um, as far as you know, horn and sinew and oh, yeah. rib bone and sinew, not even a piece of wood involved. A really short bows that when they were unstrung, they went backwards like in the shape of a C. I mean, the technology and the ability, the craftsmanship to do that is extreme. Here it wasn't necessary to do that. No, this was much more simplistic than that. So if, obviously if they could do that, this right. would, oh, yeah. would be nothing. And But here it wasn't necessary to do that. No. The only problem you had here was moisture. That's it. With white woods. Right. And like we've said a couple of times, with this design, this is what really makes sense in this environment. Right. Right here. 
Okay, so, we uh, milked that cow enough. All right. <laughs> okay, we're going to have part two coming up on tillering. This finalizes this video. Uh, just showing, you know, the process of really fire hardening a boat, you know, to the extreme here. Like Keith said, you don't have to do it to this level, but if you don't believe it can be done, when we tiller, just watch the tiller, same bows, and we'll tiller these into functional, nice weapons. It'll be part two.